good evening. How are you all? Thank, thank you so much for coming along this evening. If you excuse me, I'm just going to grab the water. <laughs> Save me. Oops. Uh, hmm. yeah. Me and electronics. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be very careful, especially when I'm messing around with water. Well, thank you very much for coming along, especially on such a lovely Friday evening. I thought that what I would do is tell you a little bit about the background to the mapping of love and death and then um, read you a small segment, and then we'll maybe take some questions. How does that sound? First of all, is everyone familiar with Maisie Dobbs here? Okay, anybody not familiar? Okay, well, we're on hungry. Okay, we'll get you going, don't worry. Excuse me. Um, I've been doing a lot of traveling on and off planes, and you know, it's, it's, it's murder. That's all I can say. You know, I mean, you, you get cold when it's, everybody else is warm, and suddenly you're warm when everybody else is cold, and you just can't get things right. Okay, so, let me kick off. One of the interesting things, I think, about developing a story is that, that very often the ideas don't all come to you in one fell swoop. There's usually different stages. Um, it was Stephen King, actually, who said that a story is born when two ideas come together. And, and certainly I've found that, although sometimes I find it takes three ideas or maybe more than, than that, you know. But things come together and there's an alchemy. And certainly with the mapping of love and death, two ideas, if you will, two of my curiosities came together. And there was a fire. And that's why I often think of that first idea, that initial thought, that initial inspiration as being like kindling. But unless kindling has a spark, it's just going to sit there as kindling, all ready to go, but with nothing to fire it up. And you sort of wait and hope that that, that spark is going to happen. Interestingly enough, the kindling sort of was laid in 2003, and it took something else that came along in 2005 for the fire to be lit under the mapping of love and death. And it took me about another three or four years to write it. So let me talk about the kindling. I've been to the battlefields of the Somme and Ypres, the World War I battlefields, uh, several times now. But my first visit was actually in 2003. And it was part personal pilgrimage, uh, that being because my grandfather was severely wounded at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. He was shell-shocked, gassed, and he had horrific leg injuries. He had already fought at the first Battle of Ypres, at what they, and also at what they call Plug Street Wood, and, you know, seen his, many of his fellow men just moan down beside him. Um, and that really was, that, those injuries at the Somme were the, were the wounds that sent him home. And throughout my childhood, I was sort of very aware of he was actually an older grandfather because he was he was not a young dad to my father he was he was getting on a little bit when my father was born and um so but i remember as a child this this man who such a dear man but but clearly suffering from his wounds so to go to the somme valley was as i say part personal pilgrimage but the other reason was that i was doing some background research for pardonable lies now, if you remember Pardonable Lies, and I think some of you have read it, uh, Maisie Dobbs, psychologist and investigator, has to go back to France as part of her investigation. And if you remember, um, she was, or in fact, for those of you that don't know, she was a battlefield nurse in the Great War. She enlisted at quite a young age. She did what many men and women did. She lied about her age. And here she is, early 30s, having to go back to a place where she lost her innocence at a very impressionable age. And when I say she lost her innocence, she lost her innocence in the way that such a thing happens when you see death of a most terrible kind. So she has to go back to France. And I decided that I would make my journey and go um, to the Somme and Ypres and walk those battlefields and go to some places. I'm really trying to get a sense and, and put myself in, the, the, in that question. How would I feel if? And in fact, as a writer, you do that a lot. Well, I speak for myself. I should claim that. I do that a lot. Um, I can't speak for everybody. But um, I, how would I feel if? 
and, and I try to think of the nearest possible experience I've had to the experience that my, my character is going through to try and get a sense of what their emotions might be. And for those of you that have read that book, you'll remember that, that actually Maisie has a, a breakdown when she goes to the site of the casualty clearing station where she herself was wounded. Um, and, and in fact, I, it was really extraordinary, just as an aside, that um, you know, Maisie was wounded when uh, the casualty clearing station uh, came under enemy shelling and I actually found a casualty clearing station cemetery where many of the people died when the, the, the unit was shelled. And so that was a really interesting phenomenon for me. But, um, th you know, there's so many things that completely move you when you make that kind of pilgrimage. It's, it's quite an emotional experience. And, you know, if I cried once, I cried a hundred times. Growing up in the UK, you have a real sense of not only the Great War, but of course the Second World War. Because there is that ongoing sense of lest we forget. On November the 11th at 11 o'clock, we observe the two-minute silence. If you're shopping in Safeway, you know everybody stops. If you're on a train, there's an announcement and you're asked to please be silent at 11 o'clock. But one of the things that you, you, you get used to is, to is seeing war memorials. There's a war memorial in every community, be it a little village, a hamlet, a big town, um, a factory, a bank, a post office. You'll see war memorials and, and sometimes it's just a plaque with the names of the, the, the fallen in the world wars. But nothing really prepared me, I think, for seeing the lists of, name, lists of names of the missing of the Great War when I went to the battlefields. So let me give you a sense of that. The Men in Gate Memorial, 54,000 names of British and Commonwealth troops who were, whose remains were never identified. Thiepful, tens of thousands of names. Tyne Cot, tens of thousands of names. The Vimy Canadian Memorial to the Missing, tens of thousands of names. So you're seeing you know, all these names of, of young men whose remains were never found or never identified. Because by the same token, you can walk through a battlefield cemetery and you'll see the plain markers and they'll have on them a soldier of the Great War known unto God. Which means that the remains that lie there were never properly identified. And there were two key reasons for this phenomenon. One was that the uh, identity disks, what we call dog tags, that were issued to British and Commonwealth troops were not made of metal. Metal was far too valuable a commodity. This was a time when people were giving up their saucepans, keeping just one to cook their own dinner because a word went out, we need all the metal you can find because we need to make munitions. People were taking down their, their iron fences, they were giving up you know, the water tank and things like that, just any metal that they could. So. The dog tags that were issued were actually made of a composite material and it, it didn't really stand the test of, of time on the ground, so to speak. It didn't take long before it disintegrated in the elements. There was a lot of mud around at the time. So you can see after a short, it didn't take long for those dog tags to completely disintegrate. But very often there were other markers for, for someone's identity, which is why you'll so, sometimes see a soldier of the Cana a Canadian regiment, because that they're buried with as much information as can possibly be found. A soldier of the Lancashire regiment, you know, a soldier of the Scots Guards, known unto God. Um, so they'll take information from the uniform or whatever. Another reason why so many men were listed as missing was actually down to the conditions, particularly at the Battle of Passchendaele. And let me give you an idea of that, because I don't think I grasped it until I went there. Even though I'd seen photographs of that battle, and I'd read about it, you know, particularly people like Siegfried Sassoon wrote about it. He said, um, I died in hell, they called it Passchendaele. 